1960s, when black and white television still ruled most of the households, and color television was just coming in. Now, don't do your math. I know a lot of you weren't born yet. You don't have to remind me. But my family, they were not early adopters. So we still had black and white television. So when I went with my mother to visit one of her friends, who was a nun living in a convent, and I saw this huge television screen she had, and it was color. I was like, wow, is this what you have to do to get a color television? <laughs> Sign me up. So there I was in my preschool understanding of what it took to get the things you want. And somebody asked the question, we always ask young children, so what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be a nun. <laughs> and they're like, really? <laughs> because I grew up in the midst of the women's liberation movement, when the question that was throughout society was, what should women be doing? And my mother, who was married to my father after a, a career in media, and was at home rearing her three daughters, used to always resent the label that was handed to her of being a housewife. She would always say, I did not marry a house. <laughs> so, but I grew up arrogantly deciding I was going to have some fabulous career. Because this is what the culture was telling us, women can do anything. So this question that we have and still wrestle with today, should women work? How should women work? is actually a question our ancestors would never have understood. They would have looked at you like, should a woman work? Do you want food? Do you want warm clothes on your body? Yes, mere survival requires all hands on deck. Let's get to work, people. But something happened in the last 300 years of human history that's changed our understanding, of, especially for women, of what it means to be both productive and fruitful. How do you work and rear the next generation? And it profoundly affected women's roles, obviously. And the question that I submit to you all today is, if we don't know the story of work, can we be sure that we don't make the error of reading our own modern experience into the scriptures, when we read verses like the counsel that Paul gave to a young pastor named Timothy, when he counseled Timothy to make sure the women in his church were not idle and gossips and busybodies, but said, I would counsel you to make sure that young widows, women who for the first time could make decisions for themselves, I would counsel young widows to marry, bear children, and manage their homes, so as not to give the adversary any room for slander. Now, on this side of the Industrial Revolution, we can tend to read that as, well, look at Paul. He's being a sexist pig. He wants women barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. But that wasn't at all what Paul was saying. You have to read the rest of the verse. It says, so that we give the enemy no occasion for slander. Paul saw that women's work was strategic, and it was an important part of the gospel. If we separate Paul's epistles from Paul's narrative examples, we're going to miss the message, because Paul partnered with women to advance the gospel. His first convert in Europe was Lydia, a woman who dealt in a luxury trade called purple cloth. And he partnered with her to advance the gospel, and it's arguable that the first church in Philippi met in her home. And she used every bit of her influence and her st strategic um, resources to advance the gospel. And when Paul and Silas were jailed for preaching the gospel, you know everybody in Philippi was like, hmm, and they're based in Lydia's house. You know there was a whiff of scandal, and she paid that price for the advance of the gospel. But she was willing to do it. And he partnered, literally, with Priscilla and Aquila as a tent maker so that they could support themselves, so that they could freely share the gospel. Paul saw that women's productivity was important. So what happened? Well, well, clearly we have in Proverbs 31, 
more verses in this superlative superwoman about financial resources than, about re than the relationship she had. It wasn't an argument. Should you be productive or you sh should you be invested in your family through most of human history? Take, for example, some of the, the great superwomen of the Reformation. You take Kate Luther. She married Martin, and he was not good at managing money. Great minds sometimes lose track of small details like budgets. And when she married him, she inherited what was essentially a frat house. It was a monastery. That, that was her wedding gift, and she had to clean it up and make it productive for them. And she was very, very prodigious in her work. She'd get up early, she worked hard, and all of Europe came flying through her household. All of Europe wanted to sit and listen to Martin Luther. They wanted to trade the news of the Reformation. And Kate knew, you know what, we're running a bed and breakfast here. we got to make this a good business. And she went to her husband and said, we need to start charging room and board. And he agreed. That did not slow down the demand. There were more than 6,000 entries that people took down of the conversations that happened at their table that influenced the course of history. And they were able to do it because Kate managed what was their income. Then you take time, you go forward to Jonathan Edwards in colonial America, one of our greatest intellectual thinkers. And there's this wonderful story about Jonathan looking up from his study one day and looking at his wife, Sarah, and saying, isn't it about time the hay got, came into the barn? And she said, oh, yeah, it was done two weeks ago. Now, Sarah had 11 children. <laughs> and like Kate, all of colonial America came to sit and listen to her husband at dinner, too. So she had a big family. She had many guests. And she lived in colonial America, which, because of the politics of the American Revolution that was about to come, said, you know what, don't buy those British consumer goods. You need to make those things. So she had to make her own candles and make her own soap. A lot of work. But she wasn't out there <laughs> with that, you know, scythe or whatever they use, I'm such a city girl, trying to get that hay in the barn. She managed the employees to get that in and managed the estate that helped pay for her family. Colonial America especially understood that productivity was a family issue. They understood that children were not only a gift from the Lord, but they were an addition to the family's productivity. You didn't have children wondering like, I wonder what my dad does. You didn't have people taking their kids to work, come to work, find out what dad does. It wasn't take your children to work day, it was that day every day. And so if you were a silversmith, your wife learned your trade. Because if you got called up to war, or you were injured or sick, somebody had to keep the family business going. Your children saw your clients. They worked with you alongside of you. When you were little, you learned to carry the slop pail. You did whatever you needed to do to make sure the family could eat. Productivity was a family issue. But along comes the Industrial Revolution. And the first industry that it disrupted was the industry that had long been women's work, textiles. And these entrepreneurs set up these great big mills in New England, and they lured the young farm girls out of their families into these towns, and they said, oh, it'll be so proper and so refined. We're going to have literary circles, and we're going to have matrons to oversee the home, and these girls are working 14, 16 hours a day, six days a week. Not a whole lot of time to be refined, but the idea was nice. And people came from around the world to see the Lowell Mill girls. Ironically, the first strike in America, the Lowell Mill girls, <laughs> who said, this is a lot of work and somebody's not getting paid. But the Industrial Revolution changed the world from being self-employed artisans, and now there are always exceptions. There were trade guilds going way back, but generally, Human history was built upon people creating their own work and their own sustenance. And suddenly you traded that to become a wage earner. And it profoundly shaped our culture, so much so that while some young girls, lower class girls and children, were being put to work in these factories, 
Other women were looking at the situation and saying, well, if there's capitalism running amok, what must we do? Well, we must refine the human soul at home. And so there was this period known as the golden age of domesticity from 1830 to 1850, where everyone said, women, they're naturally morally superior, not good theology, and they shall be in charge of refining the characters of men. Now, I don't know any men who actually like women to be refining their characters. That's generally known as nagging. <laughs> and for some reason, it's just not popular. And so during this time period, women saw themselves as being improvers of society as capitalism ran amok in our culture. And they also created what was known as the rise of the benevolent empire where women said, well, if we're in charge of refining our characters at home, we're also going to refine society. So they set out in the first social justice movement to eliminate public drunkenness and prostitution, abortion, not a modern evil, child labor, all sorts of issues. But then came the Civil War. And we lost 600,000 men in the Civil War and created the first gender imbalance in our nation's history. And suddenly you had a lot of women who didn't have family structures and needed to be put to work, but encountered all kinds of barriers to being able to get educated or to work. Interestingly, it was the church that helped solve a lot of this because the church was at the height of its missionary movement then and said, let's put what was known as redundant women, redundant women to work. <laughs> as missionaries. And so women took the cause of the gospel and went out around the world to reach the lost. But at the same time, the US Census was saying, you know what? We're only going to count the wage earners. Anything you saved or grew or made for yourself, it didn't count. Only the wage earner counted and his dependents. So suddenly, the work of anyone else in the household didn't matter. And along comes the 20th century. And now the home is shifting from a place of productivity to a place of consumption. And this is where we are today. We've stopped seeing the home as a place of, of productivity but consumption. And now we look outside and we say, how can we add value? And this is where all the struggles that we have seen through the women's liberation movement have come. And Christians, and there's a whole nother long lecture assigned to take us through the 20th century, but Christians have an answer. And that is what you find in the parable of Matthew 25. What have you been given to invest for the glory of God? It means that your life is going to look different from the lives of those who are next to you. But you have time, talent, treasures, relationships, and opportunities to invest that are different from those around you. So should women work? Yes. They should work very hard and work hard for the glory of God, but it takes extra wisdom in a culture that separates productivity from parenting. Thank you. <laughs>